I'm going to be talking to Andy Foster, who's the product director for IO Tech, an IA company. And we're going to be talking about distributed energy resources and the grid and a piece of this puzzle that you probably haven't heard of before. So welcome to the interview, Andy. Hi, nice to talk to you today, Markham. Well, thank you for being here. Now, my impression because of interviews that I've done uh, both in North America and outside North America is that grids are increasingly coming under strain because of new loads like AI center, uh, uh, data centers. Uh, and businesses are protecting themselves against unre potentially unreliable grids by adopting behind the meter distributed energy resources. So a common one would be solar plus battery plus digital controls, or they sign up to an industrial park microgrid, something like that. Is that a growing trend? It's it's absolutely growing trend. Um, you know, for for a range of reasons, for um, you know the the the. The for environmental reasons, for regulatory reasons, for the the costs associated with running a traditional grid, these new energy resources are providing you know uh, more cost effective sources of energy. Um, they need to be integrated into the traditional overall grid grid system. Um, they come with a range of challenges from a from a from a, a data and integration perspective, and also in terms of how they use the efficient efficiency within the overall grid. Uh, they, again, another set of challenges and how you actually control those energy resources and how you allow them to to contribute in the most efficient way to the to the overall you know distribution of the uh, of the energy within within the grid. We're going to get to your AI package or your AI technology in just a moment, uh, but I have one more question, and that is my impression from the again from the interviews that I've done with engineers and technical folks around the grid is that there are also uh, these problems of integration and and oper operability um, are are being solved by uh, tremendous innovation. All sorts of little you know solutions are popping up to fix these problems. And things that we would never hear about, the average person would never hear about, but that's really becoming greasing the skids of, of greater renewables uh, adoption, uh, as especially as electrification increases. Is that a correct assumption, do you think? It absolutely is. Um... You know, one of the one of the one of the clear trends in terms of uh, managing these distributed ener energy resources, particularly from an integration point of view, uh, for uh, from a, a control and latency point of view, is that uh, there's a much greater use of edge computing. New edge computing solutions are one of the mechanisms that can address some of the key problems, whether it's acquiring the data and normalizing it, reducing the latencies in terms of how you actually control and uh, you, uh, manage these um, the distributed energy resources. Have you hung up? No. Uh, so I I want to ask another, another question before we get into IOTEX AI, uh, and that is, what in the world is edge computing? I've heard I I heard it, but don't understand it. Well, basically, edge computing uh, is the is the umbrella uh, umbrella term for basically where we where we uh, where we locate the the uh, the, the processing and the control uh, of these types of uh, uh, de deployment uh, in comparison to basically, um, uh, for example, having all of your management of the grid uh, uh, done in, done in, in the cloud. Uh, which particularly when you're bringing on new streams of uh, of any uh, energy source, um, the, the 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 processing is is now being uh, distributed from the cloud and pushing pushing much closer to the to the uh, the sources of uh, where the energy is being produced for a number of reasons, you know, particularly for th reasons like uh, whether it's latency for actually having a more responsive yeah. grid control system but also just because of things like the the, the increased volume of data that's been ge generated the shipping costs of moving all that data up to the cloud for process for, for, for processing and obviously for the other reasons such as security edge computing moves that processing much much closer to the the sources of where the where the equipment are where the distributed energy resources are so that's it in, 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 in the you know 20,000 foot 
Sure. Uh, and edge AI, which is what uh, IoT uh, IoT uses, I understand then is is essentially AI running on the, those computers, which are close to the source of the power generation, the distributed power generation. Uh, that, that's right. So obviously, we, when you're running different types of workload, whether it's um, something as sophisticated as a you know mo a modern AI model or even your your traditional control systems, you've got choices about where you actually where you actually run that logic. Um, uh, you know, obviously, or if probably in the in the cloud, you've got access to a large amounts of computing resource, and they can run very large, sophisticated models. But for perhaps doing, um, you know, much uh, having uh, processing or analytics that's done at very high speed, and you know, perhaps making control decisions. Then it makes a lot of sense to run it on on the edge, and maybe have a um, a more efficient model that can run uh, in the in the edge environment. Well, let's talk about exactly the problem that your technology solves: uh, uh, making data talk to each other. Uh, maybe you could explain that. Yeah, well, it, it, with with this plethora of new sources of data, new distributed energy resources that are all contributing to this this modern grid. Uh, you've had an explosion. Uh, you have, a, have an explosion in data. So, to start with, you've got a um, data acquisition issue across all these different types of distributed energy resource. You've got many different types of uh, equipment that are deployed within the distributed energy resource, like a battery energy storage system. The equipment comes from lots of different vendors. So, initially, you've got an acquisition issue about how do I uh, normalize the acquisition of the data if i have lots of different equipment types and speaking lots of different communication pro protocols so that's one one um problem that uh, our edge technology supports so for example independently from the the hot the underlying hardware whether it's your inverters your batteries and things like that and the protocols that they are built on to 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 that allows you to read and write that data or software can take that data independently from the fr from the equipment and at massive scale so for example some of the largest um for example uh, we do do a lot of work with uh, customers in that do battery energy storage systems for example on some of the largest deployments you may be talking about millions of different data points that have to be acquired per second so the software has to be able to scale uh, to 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 and manage that uh, that that data at that scale, but as I said, or, or also be able to talk to lots of to talk to the the OT equipment independently from from the OT equipment, then bring it in to. Uh, Go ahead. So, Another question. I I do, Andy. Uh, how is this before your uh, technology before AI was available? My understanding is that a lot of this was done manually, which would be. I would assume a real bottleneck. Uh, that's right. There was a lot of point solutions to to basically get access to, uh, get access to the data to the data, um, uh, and a lot of data and a lot of that was to to do with shipping shipping the data up to the cloud and then trying to normalize it once it's you know put it into a big database on the on the cloud for example, and then try to filter and streamline and normalize the data on the cloud. But for the reasons I talk talk. I mentioned already because of the latency, the number of new types of energy source that's coming on, on stream and the volume of the data, that's just not practical anymore. So it has to be processed much lo closer to, 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 to where those, the, the, the data is being generated. And as I said, the other challenge, as I said, uh, you, you are pulling data from lots of different types of equipment. You need to normalize that data as well. So not even just access the data independently from the protocols, the equipment type, you need to bring it into the edge environment. You need to normalize it in a common format that can be uh, used to drive the applications, apply the applications, the control systems that are running on 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 the on the edge. So that's another problem. Problem. So you need to be able to um, provide that data. It comes off in various different formats fr from all of the equipment. You need to normalize that into a common format, and then be able to drive the applications that are doing the local processes and on the edge. Um. It, it seems like with every new technology, there's always an issue of eventually compatible standards or a single standard within the That's industry. right. And it, uh, if my understanding here is that your uh, standard that's emerged is called SunSpec. Maybe you could ex explain that. 
That's that's correct. So, for example, uh, even if you can independently talk to uh, the, the different equipment that that may 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 be uh, required within your 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 DER, um, uh, the the, the uh, and independently fr from the the communication protocols that you use it using each device potentially. Um, the data that you're ac accessing from the equipment, the, the tags and stuff, they all, the, each manufacturer may provide uh, the, for example, the naming conventions for those tags will be proprietary to the uh, to the manufacturer. So, for example, if you're using the batteries or inverters for manufacturer A and manufacturing B for a different deployment, if you're, a, you know, one of the supplier of uh, battery energy storage systems, for for example, then uh, your application uh, will have to be rewritten to perhaps process the data from a different manufacturer, even if you can, you know, even if they're using a, co a common protocol. What Spun SunSpec allows, or the, the the standard allows you to do, it provides a a, a, st a, ca a standard naming and tagging convention. And actually, the later versions of the standard actually can add you can add context and structure into the data that's coming off the equipment. So that means that the application, from a portability point of view, you can uh, you can normalize the actual names of the the data values that are, that are coming off independently from the equipment. So if you imagine that your application is used to uh, accessing data with specific names and uh, SunSpecs gives you the ability to, to normalize across a common set of names. And it means that you're, when you deploy, uh, uh, you know, you've used vendor A's equipment and then you decide to perhaps to deploy on top of vendor B, you have a uh, you have a common interoperability in terms of all of the names of the data, so it means your applications don't have to necessarily be rewritten for every every um, different configuration of equipment. Let me try to su uh, summarize this, Andy. See if I've got it right. So uh, up to now, or up to recently, um, the various DER devices, batteries, or wind turbines, whatever they were, yep. um, sent their data into the cloud and where it was normalized so that the system operator, power, the grid system operator could use it and make decisions accordingly. Yep. That was very inefficient and, yep. and it worked very well. So now you put the computers right down close to the source of the DER, those batteries or wind turbines, and and that is just a much more efficient system. You can... You can uh, it, it normalizes all of the data that comes from the various devices and sends out one stream of, of data to the operator who then can make uh, much more uh, efficient decisions. Have I got that more or less right? Well, but well, but actually, a lot of it, is, a lot of a lot of this is automated. You can imagine um, with a with a modern grid, what you need is to be potentially. Uh, Depending on uh, conditions, load on the all, all over our grid, you need to be able to switch some of these different types of distributed energy resource on demand. And for example, in the in the you know, previous generations, the if the, if the data those if those decisions were being done in the cloud, the latencies involved were quite significant. You know, minutes or you know tens of minutes and things. To, to whereas now, if you want to bring in some additional capacity. Because you're making those decisions locally, uh, uh, closer to the where the, the, the energy resource energy resources is deployed, then those the grid can be those decisions can be made, you know, at a far far uh, less latency than you know in the traditional systems, and that's what you need because you may be bringing in batteries at certain points of the of the day, or you might be. Uh, you know, might 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 be might be taking the power directly from from the from the uh, the the sources of the generation and things like that. So it's a much more re you need it for these much more um, heterogeneous um, dynamic grids. So you need to be able to process and make those dis decisions uh, much more quickly than than there was the, the how a traditional grid operated. Well, Andy, thank you very much for this. This is a very technical issue for my audience, but I think it's a little peek behind the curtain that's very useful for us. So thank you very much for this. Thank you. Nice talking to you.